individual artworks that are currently on view. Um, tonight we have, I think, seven or eight people speaking. I believe everybody is here except, I'm just checking my list, except Patrick tonight. Um, <clears throat> so we're glad to have you. It's um, It's been a, a great journey in this workshop. So just a little bit about the course to give you an idea of how everybody got into this space tonight. Um, so the course actually has run from September until February. And uh, we invited, or we had a workshop of eight people. And the goal was to put on two separate exhibitions at University Place and also Canal Gallery that are both um, auxiliary spaces of Cambridge Art Association. So you'll see in the um, installation shots that they're very different spaces. And I, the other night we were joking that it was a meeting of about eight strangers and trying to formulate how an exhibition could come together in both of these spaces. Um, so it turned out that we actually have the eight artists in each of the exhibition spaces. And to me, it's, it's pretty amazing how the same artists could come together in two different shows and then feel connected, but also two very separate exhibitions. Um, so we'll share some works tonight, and we hope you can make it during the run of the show, which goes through um, next weekend. We'll close it on the ooh, 9th or 10th, sorry. Um, so tonight, I'm going to go through, we're going to read some of the curatorial statements, and I have some questions for the curators as well as the artists exhibiting. Um, so I had some questions, and then Alyssa Meadows has provided some really deep insight um, questions that we'll continue to ask. So slightly informal, I'll direct um, the questions toward which artist I um, uh, could would speak to it. So feel free to put questions in the chat. Um, and I'm going to go through. Uh, Claire is going to read these beautiful statements that she's written for each of the shows. So we'll start with Rites of Passage, which is currently on view at University Place. So Claire, mm -hmm. hopefully this is not too small or you have it in front of you too. There we go, unmuted. And I'm wearing my glasses, so I think I got this. Um, so first we've got Rites of Passage. Welcome to the exhibition Rites of Passage, where we explore the profound human experiences of life transitions, rituals, and personal and cultural voyages through the lens of eight distinct artists. This curated collection of 35 works celebrates the diverse ways individuals and communities navigate the transitional events of new beginnings, coming of age, mourning, personal healing, and the physicality of the journey itself. The quarantine of 2020 prompted Nilu Muchala to complete a series of 365 drawings, a daily ritual that bears witness to the height of the pandemic and a way to move through it. A vision of effinescent figures in limbo by Yildiz Gradowski reflects the fragility of life. Other works by the artist evoke the passing of knowledge between generations or simpler transitions like going to the park. Patrick Brennan's concrete molds of soda bottles show the destructive rituals of consumerism and the damage their content causes by passing through one's body. In Alyssa Meadows' black and white photography, keepers of ingrained belief systems and rituals fight against and gain prominence over women's rights. On an intimate level, Sage Brousseau's atmospheric photographs speak of transition, legacies, and the transmission of knowledge between a late mother and a growing daughter. Between the intra and interpersonal, Anne-Marie Delaney Denisio accesses and shares her inner world through her blue paintings and silver drawings. Claire Lima ritually walks around her Somerville studio to collect humble and dismissed weeds, transforming them into luscious three-dimensional tableau and Liz Sotori upcycles discarded fabrics she hand dyes to weave intricate and contemplative tapestries. Life is a continuous wild ride of pivotal moments that shape our identities and shift our perspectives. 
whether it involves the metamorphosis from adolescence to adulthood, navigating the intersections of different cultures or confronting and overcoming limiting beliefs. Rites of passage can act as a catalyst for self-discovery and foster communal bonds. As you embark on your physical journey down the exhibition corridor, you might encounter unexpected connections and emotions that resonate with your milestones and stories. Thank you so much, Claire, for reading sure. that and writing those. Um, so here is an installation view of the passageway at um, University Place. And I would love to invite Anne-Marie to speak a bit about the curatorial process um, as she made these pairings for how they would um, be situated in the room. And Anne-Marie, I would love for you to talk a bit about the process of going, um, working primarily with digital images and meeting all of each other in this virtual space and then how it came to be to live in a physical space and how um, that conversation sort of shifted. Okay. <laughs> Well, yes, I guess we did, uh, you know, download a, a lot, a lot of pictures. We had initially a presentation, uh, kind of trying to. So there, it, it was followed by a lot of brainstorming. Then the, you know, the title came, and from the title, uh, I did organize. Uh, so from the title, from uh, all the, the input of the eight artists, and um, so I I played uh, digitally with the images, and you know following the following the blueprint and my knowledge of the space, I you know put all the uh, pieces together. Um, how they are in dialogue uh, in terms of the overall concept of the exhibition, but also um, just aesthetically, <laughs> you know, how they uh, bounce back, you know, uh, with each other and communicate, uh, both in terms of the uh, ID and in terms of the, the way they look together. <laughs> Um, so I use a separation by section and, and, and you know, had uh, two or three pieces, you know, in one section together. So here's an example of a slide that Anne-Marie had put together while we were planning the show and then a view of how it actually looks in this space. Um, I would love actually, you know, going through some of the install shots today, um, how the color of the space actually affects the work on the wall. Um, I, since there's two of Nilu's images in this, I would love to ask um, how the background color, this sort of pinky color, um, interacts with these works and how um, in different spaces they could take on uh, different different lives and different meanings. I knew you were going to select me to go <laughs> once I saw the slide up. Hi, I'm Nilu. I'm one of the artists in, who was participating in this workshop. Um, actually, in the previous slide, the entry hallway thing, I was thinking exactly the same thing that you're bringing up. This passage has this kind of muted pinkish tone to it and you know it actually kind of softens a lot of the images um, that are up against it we were so used to seeing everything digitally that actually walking through it in the space um, all of them you know are kind of um, yeah much softer and like there's a really nice sort of um, space around them to you know sit and work with each other and I really enjoyed how Anne-Marie put some of these pieces in conversation with each other in terms of not only, you know, topically, but also thematically, but also color wise. And as you go through the passage, you finally end up at this large, large piece on the, you know, end wall and it's 
quite stunning actually. So you have these smaller pieces that then build up and weave to this, you know, different circular organic moment. Um, yeah, it's, but it is a passageway and, you know, we were, I think we were struggling with that a lot when we were trying to figure out how to use it. Anne Marie, would you agree? Um, yes, I, I I totally agree. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, the, to, trying to uh, you know get the best from um, from the structure of the building of the of the exhibition space, and uh, and I I think we did well in you know using this idea of you know, passage, passageway and, and corridor and and play with it. Absolutely. Um, some of the pairings I found were really strong. And once you know the stories of the artists and what is bringing them to the space to create the works, um, really amplifies the message and I think as we look at images as just freestanding on the wall, we have the space to add our own interpretations, our own histories to them. Um, and I would like uh, Sage and Alyssa um, to join in this conversation and speak to these two works, how they're actually, they're supportive. So Sage's work is about the mother-daughter relationship and Alyssa's um, is about the rights to um, abortion access and all of the barriers in between. Um, so having these two paired together um, is really powerful. And I'd love for you two to speak maybe about the background of the work and um, how seeing two pieces like this together um, has sort of informed how you look at your own work in a way. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really interesting to see these works side by side, um, and sharing the same space, um, because I, I may have not thought to do that previously. Um, this piece of mine, Clairvoyant, is, um, from a series that I was sort of mid-process of during the pandemic. My daughter was either just about to turn 13 or had just turned 13. And I was really starting to think about that time in, in her life and, and of, you know, a young woman's life um, and just the significance of it. So it's really interesting to have it. Um, and not so much like it's, it, in, in the series, <clears throat> I was sort of exploring our relationship as well, but um, really marking a time in her life um, and having it, you know, sort of in the greater context of, you know, what's happening in our country and, and of all women's lives is really kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Um, I'd love to hear Alyssa, her, her perspective on it as well. Um, for me, it was very much a reminder to reflect on the flip side of the whole conversation surrounding women's bodily autonomy and choices about embracing or rejecting motherhood, because I'm so personally outside that mindset and in the, the space of not wanting children, that it for me, it was a really nice reminder to have that, that juxtaposition of the mother-daughter relationship, the choice to embrace that and take that on and explore it and finding it enriching your life as compared to, for me, I know that would not be, I'm not saying there wouldn't be high points to being a, a parent and becoming a mother, but that's not my personal dream and, and end goal in this life. So it, for me, it was a very interesting way to, to show that neither side is right or wrong. It's all about what you choose for yourself. And so I thought it was a really nice way to, you know, have communication and dialogue between the pieces. Uh, Alyssa, I'd love to for you to elaborate on your process of finding these sites and what it's like for you to interact with protesters, people who are um, on the on the giving side, on the medical side. Um, maybe how you started, what has worked, what hasn't. Um, I know 
you know, working in photography primarily that we're, you know, people seen with a camera can be seen as like an agitator or an aggressor. And I think that <laughs> actually adds to uh, what you're speaking to. So I'd love to hear a bit about um, how you got started on this project. Sure. And um, yeah, it started when I started it. I did not think it was going to have to be as extensive and expansive as the project has become because I started it. I happened to be on the road when Texas basically made their anti-abortion bill. And so I started documenting it while I was traveling through the state, thinking I was just going to be aiming to amplify women's voices in Texas. And then I was on the road again, working on a different project when the SCOTUS leak about you know, repealing Roe v. Wade came out and realized it had to be a much larger project. So now it's just an ongoing process of, I basic in, in regards to the process, what I've done is I have um, a Google map built out that I have every single abortion clinic in the entire country on that map. And then when I go on the road, I see how many of them I can go through and try to time it to match events in that space. We just went down to Washington DC to photograph the March for Life. And that was a whole different experience. <laughs> and then the Women's March was the next day. So trying to coordinate when and where I am to what's happening in both sides of the movements. Um, and I always tell myself I'm going to go in quietly, but they very quickly, you know, the protesters very quickly figure out I am not on their team because they try to be friendly with me and I'm not I aspire to be capable of it and so far it's been very challenging. So they figure out pretty quickly that I'm I'm on the opposing side, so to speak, and it I've I've had them physically get physical with me in a minor way, but you know, still it's not always the safest feeling space, but one that I feel is important to fight back in, especially since for me the way I view these people are are infringing on personal space. And so I kind of aim in a way to use my camera as a way to give them a taste of their own medicine because they very frequently don't like me getting in their faces with my camera and getting as close to them as I do and invading invading what they see as their space. And they don't always recognize the hypocrisy when I say, what do you think your experience is like for the women that are going to these clinics that you're talking to. So it's been an interesting exploration to see the the double think that kind of exists in some of these spaces. I think I answered everything. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> and this image is actually from um, a grid that is at Canal Street. So we're going to jump around a little bit. Can't help it. Um, thank you, Alyssa, for making this work. Um, so I would love to ask Liz, um, this question actually posed by Alyssa, you've self-described the development of your work as an escape to your happy place during the de development of these two shows. Is the escape for you a form of self-care? Are you hoping the viewer to escape with you? Um, and are there deeper meanings to the pieces themselves? Um, or is the purpose to transport the artist and the viewer to your calming alternate reality of uh, the escape? Honestly, all of the above. For <laughs> me, the process of making art is escapism in its highest form. It's where it's, have you ever heard of the state of flow you can get in where you time kind of escapes you? When I'm working, eight hours can go by and it feels like one or two. So I do get completely lost in my work and I have to say nothing really makes me happier. So for me, it is about going to my happy place to create these pieces. And I think that the fact that they do appear to be portals into some sort of magical, lush, serene place is not by mistake. Um, when I'm working, I do a lot of commission pieces. And when I'm working with clients, my first question, as I usually ask them about a place that holds importance to them where they're the happiest, or if there's a feeling that they want to feel when they look at the piece. So it really is about taking somebody someplace good and warm 
happy, safe, and I hope it accomplishes that. I don't really like to tell people what the piece is about because what it's visually representing to me might not be what it represents to them. And I, I think it's important that it takes you where it takes you. And that's what it's about. And it might not be the same for everybody. Yeah, I like that response. I've always, I get very distracted by captions sometimes in museums where they're like telling you what to feel about a piece. Um, and too much information can sometimes disconnect you, right? Where you put this expectation of how you should feel. Um, I appreciate the information of knowing what something is, but sometimes that piece of the mystery is actually, um, is really part of it. Um, on the topic of materials, I'd love to have Claire speak to um, her works a bit, where these materials come from. Um, we ask, do you have a piece in mind before you begin or is the piece informed by what you have um, coming home with materials? And um, I would love for you to speak to that sort of organic nature of finding and creating. Sure. Um, well, I'll start with the materials themselves. Um, in this piece, it looks like I have Japanese knotweed, common reed, sumac. Um, I should have the list of all the materials next to me. That looks like evening primrose in the middle um, and birch. And then um, a combination. I, I like to work with felt also. There's um, there's actually a, a farm on Etsy where I, I buy like an entire shearing of a sheep. So a lot of that is, is, you know, from those guys. And then I get like pre-dyed stuff also just because it's so soft and luscious and, and I don't have to hand card it. Um, and then there's um, synthetic fibers also, because I always like to add a little bit of, of shine because I'm trying to kind of counterbalance the idea that these are humble weeds that I'm working with. I'm trying to elevate them to, to, um, you know, more balanced place. Um, when I am out foraging, most of this stuff is, is, uh, things that you see along highways and, you know, around my studio or I'm on route one a lot. Cause I live in Saugus, um, construction sites are great. So these are all um, like first succession plants. Um, so they come in and they um, kind of like take over the soil um, that have been like disrupted by construction or other kind of human activity. And they get a really bad rap, you know, they're called invasive species and whatnot, but they are actually like freely providing nitrogen to the soil without us having to do anything. So I just like to remind people that it's not all black and white, just like everything in life. You know, the, everything's got a good side, even when it has a bad side. And I feel like these guys have been just super villainized. So I love them and I really enjoy, you know, going on my walks and foraging and I've got a big basket I wear on my back and I fill it up, it's great. Um, and oftentimes I do have an idea of what I'm gonna make when I'm gathering things. It rarely turns out that way though. I start like putting things together and then, you know, I don't know, like a piece of sumac is just shaped in such a way where I'm like, no, nah, it's, it's, we're just gonna have to change the whole thing. Um, here you're seeing a lot of my two dimensional works. Usually with those, I'm really just trying to make something like harmonious and lavish looking again, cause I'm trying to kind of like create that balance, you know, like bringing the, the calibration of the weed up to, you know, a neutral position. And then in my other works, uh, there are more like standing figures. Um, and that is just, I'm, I'm also trying to convey to the viewer. Thank you. There's one. I'm also trying to convey to the viewer, um, like an appreciation for these places, because a lot of times you look at, at, uh, the sites where these plants grow and you think it's abandoned, it's not taken care of, it's ugly, it's a sign of um, neglect, um, but there is a beauty to it. And I 
want viewers to have a relationship with those places too, not just manicured parks. And so I feel like if I'm either creating like a lush landscape or something that's like anthropomorphizing these plants, there will be like more of a human connection. So that's my aim with the shapes and designs. So there you have it. Nice. This is an install from Canal as well, but it does feel like a living element when you're next to these um, structures. I was there on Wednesday and even walking from the outside, you get sort of like a, hey, you know, and they do feel like people, people you know, which is, uh, I don't know, a fascinating part. Um, so Yeldiz, I um, want to invite you to speak a bit to your work, um, you know, Claire was just speaking to this space and sort of the specificity of space. Um, and your work is very abstract and ambiguous. And um, for those wishing to demystify your work, how would you define what your work is about? Or how would you um, like viewers to perceive it or, and walk away with either an emotion or inspiration even? I know every time I see you, I feel inspired to dance and move and walk somewhere. Um, and I feel like knowing you and um, seeing your work in real life, I could sort of see that correlation of, of just movement. Oh, don't forget to unmute. I, I couldn't do that before, but okay. Um, all of the above, like someone else said, actually, um, my work is all about connections and relationships. They are abstract, but I call them uh, semi-abstract because there's always an element, a recognizable element in them, especially figures. Uh, and lately, more than just figures, I've been working on um, body parts, more than just the entire figure. And each series is... Um, there is an, this one is uh, actually, this is, I like the way uh, Anne-Marie described the word limbo, which I did not myself because this was about, are they, they are figures, are they appearing or disappearing? Is this here or beyond? Are we here, are we there, are we coming or are we leaving? That was the idea of all these figures in this series. And there are some few pieces, I guess, in the show from that series. Um, connections is very important. Uh, not only connections between people, the relationship between people, but also my own connection to my work. I want my work and I to complete each other. I want to be connected so fully until so that I can sign a piece. And uh, inspiration sounds so wonderful. If I can inspire anyone, the viewer is wonderful, of course, but uh, it's all about feeling, not what they see, but they what the, how they feel. They are always uh, narratives, especially lately. When, when I say lately for the last couple of years, really, almost every piece has a narrative, my own narrative, but uh, unless uh, I'm cornered into it, you know, so to speak, to tell what is the narrative, what is this, what is the story behind the piece? I don't want to tell everybody. If I can take someone, people, the viewer, to a place, to to someone in their life, to a moment, and they can experience this, that's all I'm trying to accomplish. And it happens. And sometimes when I hear from the collectors their reaction and then even if they cry over it, it just makes me incredibly, incredibly uh, fulfilled. I guess that's the word, satisfied. Um, uh, what else can I say? I can talk about my pieces forever really, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else, how else can I describe what I'm making? Um, there are pieces in both uh, exhibitions from series, all, not the entire series. And in, actually to my surprise, some of them were divided. They were separated within the 
series and they were paired with different pieces, either other artist pieces or my own piece, but from two different from two different set, uh, series, they were put together next to each other. And that really, like that transition piece, for instance, the transition was from the series of Show Me How, that that was a transition either from generation to generation or from place to place. There is uh, going from one place to another or from one uh, generation to another, from one mind into another. And to take that into a physical uh, transition, take me to the park, into the park, that was so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, thank you. yeah, I do different settings. Um, I do wanna talk a bit more about transitions when we get to the canal space um, with some of Nilo's work. Um, but as we're still at University Place, I just wanted to go, sh go through and make sure we see all of the brilliant pairings that we had here. Um, these are two works by Sage and a piece from Patrick as well. And we learned while we were all introducing work to one another um, about Patrick's drive to make this. And I'm just gonna speak on his behalf and triple check he's not here. Um, because it really stuck with me, this idea of making soda bottles and it being paired with these, uh, this image that has to do with teeth. And I believe he was like advised to stop drinking soda because it was affecting his teeth. And I remember in that class that being sort of like an aha moment where it's like, oh, okay, we're going to find these sort of bizarre connections. Um, and then it really develop into this this greater narrative um, about rituals. You know, I, I keep, always think about the tooth fairy. Um, so Anne-Marie, if you wanna speak a, a bit to this pairing specifically, I think it's um, it adds sort of an element of humor and also sort of a, um, I don't know, an awareness of our own skeleton that sometimes could be discomforting. <laughs> uh Yes, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think it was all about the body, the vulnerability of the body, and the ritual. I mean, the the first omens, you know, with this petal, you know, uh, it's you know about life and decay for me, and uh, and then you know the 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 the, the growing up and losing teeth and the um when she presented that photograph sage uh said that um you know she had heard that in some culture that mother swallow the teeth of their children when they did so and then she talked about her catholic background and so there was this association between you know the the, the tooth the, which, uh, which she did not swallow <laughs> but took the picture and and the catholic ritual and then this you know ritual about what we uh absorbed mentally and physically and the the the, the, the ritual of uh now drinking things which are toxic for for your body and the representation of that ritual, you know, in its, uh, what it's actually do, you know, that the, the fact that these are concrete mold uh, really show how toxic the product are, but it's, it has become, you know, become, you know, part of contemporary culture. Um, so, yeah, so there was all, all, all this issue of ritual and vulnerability and the, the body and uh, so that I, I thought I, I really wanted to associate these three pieces together. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, so now let's move in at, at 640. So now we're going to move into the canal gallery space which is in Kendall Square. So Claire, if I can invite you to read this wonderful statement as well, and then we'll go through some of the images from this show. Sure. 
All right, the alchemy of traveling inward. In this human experience, we find ourselves immersed not in a world of fixed forms, but in a realm of paradoxes. Through the lens of alchemy, this collection of artworks explores the intricately woven system of personal transformation in response to the, these paradoxes. As a result, the works themselves begin to merge the borders between humans and objects. This exhibition's core revolves around transmutation, the process of transforming from one state to another. Just as alchemists sought to transmute materials, the eight featured artists employ various mediums to transmute their experiences, emotions, and struggles into visual narratives. A shift in consciousness occurs when journeying inward, where simultaneous extremes can coexist, oppression and bliss, creation and destruction, growth and decay. The true magic unfolds when embracing these opposing forces and transcending the veil of duality. The artworks undergo a prof profound metamorphosis, not only in their relationship with one another, but also in their connection with the viewer. How might the dying whisper in your ear? Does the statuesque entanglement in the corner exude dominance or foster protection? Can an arrangement of objects and mementos trigger an introspective dialogue? Does the imprint of a brain elicit sensations within your brain? Can an inanimate object embrace you in return? A connection to the mystical is cultivated by posing these questions, opening oneself up to unexpected discoveries, and boom, alchemy. Anais Nin is attributed to saying, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. While this truth may have limitations, it this is a captivating beauty and encapsulates the essence of, human be of being human. The alchemy of traveling inward celebrates the interplay between humanity and the intangible, inviting visitors to question their beliefs and discover the potential of alchemy within us all. So beautiful. Um, I'd love to bring up these three works installed by Nilu in this space, um, which for me was one of those moments of seeing a JPEG of, of a piece and then experiencing it in real life. And it was a completely um, new experience. So to kind of come back to this conversation about transition and passageway and traveling um, liter literally and metaphorically, um, Nilo, much of your work revolves around the immigrant, immigrant experience, blending in overlapping worlds that don't always perfectly mesh. Um, and frequently you reference the inherent transience of home and it no longer existing as a concrete and tangible um, space. What, um, how would you describe the concept of finding a space that you call home? Or home. is this this unanswerable question I think a lot of us um, work mm -hmm. with on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, not so much that, you know, sad immigrant experience like I have left to strive forth, but my own yeah. unique immigrant experience. Um, well, so these three suitcases, there's only three suitcases in the show, but they're part of a series of 10. And um, each suitcase actually points to a specific time period, experience or emotion in the artist's life. For example, this one we're looking at right now is called Rona, which means to cry. It's about a loss of a parent, a loss of a loved one with actual artifacts that belong to that person. A little side story is my, that's my father. He passed away about 12 years ago. So it was so cathartic and beautiful to be able to go to this place and make this everybody in life has lost somebody, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's a parent, a uh, friend, you know, et cetera. So just each suitcase in the series tries to tap into some sort of human emotion or experience. And although they're so personal um, in terms of, you know, objects or artifacts in them, they become universal in terms of like, you know, emotions and feelings and experiences that we all go through. This one is called Hamara, which is ours. And it's about ancestors. I mean, everybody has ancestors, whether you like them or not is another question, <laughs> but you know. They're there. And um, when you leave home, you actually can't carry that many things with you. And these are like some of the artifacts I have left of like the grandparents generation, you know, my ancestors, two generations or more previous. 
So just going through some of these objects and items brings back some of those memories to life. Um, to create this different story for going forward to the next generation. Also, what do you pass on? Like, what is that feeling of home? Can you remake it in a new place? And um, am I trying to do that for myself in a place that, you know, I've come to, but also how do you recreate that for like the next generation that's growing up here, which is really important. Um, so it's been kind of like, a, and also these different aspects, you know, to the artist's practice and the artist's life. It's not just joy, it could be pain, it could be frustration, it could be totally falling apart. I think there's a suitcase called um, uh, uh, Torna, which means to break. And I, I, I actually violently broke lots of pieces of things to put in that suitcase. It's all about anger and destruction. So just bringing all those out into the space, you know, to talk about like, the sorts of landscapes that we all flow through as artists too, even in creating one piece, forget, you know, 10 suitcases that there is this whole challenge in trying to figure out, you know, when do we stop? Is it finished? Like, do we keep going? What's that moment when you know, um, like Liz was talking about being in the flow, you know, like that sort of ecstatic, mo you go into an altered state when you're an artist, you, you do, um, you're just in this other space. So, when do you realize that's done? And the interesting thing with these suitcases is I re, uh, whenever I assemble them, it always is slightly different. Um, they've been in a couple of shows and it's always different due to the limitations of the space or, you know, however it's installed. So that's been really interesting for me, actually, how they all work. They're not always all showing together either, which is a different story. So it's been, uh, yeah, really like a, process of getting to know myself honestly by re-looking at these pieces and what what each of them you know each one says specifically but then together how they all unite I don't know if that answers your question but yeah uh, really beautiful um sort of to go back to that question you just mentioned you know there's these joyous aspects and um all the other emotions in between um we became familiar with Liz's work sort of focused on this joyous creation and um, delivery, but there's one piece that we have on the title wall that says, is this piece on the right that reads rescue me. And it's lit up with this neon light and it has a bit of a different energy from your other works, Liz. Um, if you could speak to what, the inclusion of text, sort of the origin space of that and how this piece affects you and how you think um, putting this really deliberate text that is eye-catching to anybody walking by, uh, what was your goal there? Um, this was very much a pandemic piece. So I think that speaks for itself in a lot of ways. I think we were all feeling like somebody please help me. Um, I think universally people were feeling lost, confused. I had been laid off from my job as an event planner. And this was one of my first pieces that I did before I made the decision that I was going to pursue art full time. And I think in a really weird cland clandestine way, putting this rescue me sign into the piece kind of helped me figure out how to rescue myself and have the confidence to go forward and really take the leap. Um, I had always been so practical, you know, like you have to have health insurance and you need to have this and that. And the weird slowness of the pandemic made me realize that um, I can rescue myself and find my own path and do what I want to do and survive. And that's kind of what the piece started off as and what it's turned into is discovering that I think I did kind of find my own way out. Um, I also had really, the pandemic, I went to Art Miami Art Basel December before, of 2019 and there was neon everywhere and I was so inspired and I was like I want to use it and somehow figure out how to incorporate this into my work and then by the time 
I got around to it. It was like, life has changed so drastically. Let me see if I can find a neon that really says something about the world we're in. <laughs> Absolutely. <So yeah. laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to in another install shot. Um, Sage was responsible for the layout um, of, of this show. And I think there's a, a few connections actually on this wall and around the corner um, that are really, really powerful. Um, so I just want to get the correct things on my screen. So I'm just going to show you two install shots so you can see how the show sort of turns. Um, so we have Claire's works in the corner, Aly Alyssa and Sh Sage flanking that, and then this beautiful wall here. So Sage, if you wouldn't mind speaking to some of these connections, for me, these two are just a, a beyond beautiful pair. Um, and then also in the space, seeing these two works next to each other, um, with like the scarring and either. So I guess it's a double-edged question of how did um, being in the space with these pieces um, prompt you to pair them? Um, and then also how you view, sit, both of these pairs actually have a piece of yours in it. So what was that relationship of um, including your own work in this process and, um, I don't know, maybe the emotions behind that in a curatorial space. Yeah. Um, so it was really apparent to me once we started this process that, well, at first it wasn't apparent that there were going to be logical connections between our work. And it was very like, wow, how are we going to do this? But then once we started sharing more images, sharing more work, sharing more stories, it was really obvious um, that there were really strong threads between all of the work. And I think that Claire's words really summarize it beautifully. Um, but um, I was already starting to see connections in the work, um, just looking at them like, on, on screen. Um, and then once having them in the space, um, they were, they really started to develop conversations the pieces the work was really talking to each other um I, I could tell that it 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 would just looking at the images you know online um but once I had them all in the space it was just really apparent how how they were conversing and and, and you know which ones kind of worked well together um in terms of sort of curating my own work it was uh, a challenge in that I I kind of had to like disassociate it from myself, um, which is also really a, a, a an enormous challenge because my work is so deeply personal. Um, but it's really interesting. These two pieces are from a series about loss. Um, and so it's really nice to have them so um, close to Nilo's work as well, because again, like these, these threads are just like from just bouncing from one to the other. And, and really what we're all talking about is just this how we're all navigating the human landscape like what how are we navigating life as artists as people as humans um and then just um how do they speak to one another um and sort of inform each other as well and and particularly with my own work i you know obviously have um a message that I'm trying to share, but I also really like the opportunity for um, the viewer to bring their own meaning to it. So pairing all the works together, it just creates new meaning um, in a really magical way. Mm. Absolutely. Um, wow, time is really flying here tonight. Um, I have a couple more questions. Um, so this is another install shot that includes uh, Yildiz, Patrick, and Alyssa. And being in this space, this is kind of a technical question, um, but I've, I've worked in exhibits forever and the, the idea of the midpoint has always varied from person to person, from space to space. Um, and I know when we were there for the opening, Yildiz, you mentioned, you're like, oh, well, this is good for that person who's this tall. Um, so maybe you could speak a little bit to 
just how we physically interact with pieces in a space. I think it's a huge part of the curatorial process and um, can really influence how we navigate a space. So if you wanted to quickly just uh, talk about the literal height and how you interacted with your works in this space. Me? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly how to answer that actually, because um, this came out really beautifully. Uh, I wasn't sure how this was gonna work out because like you say, there was such differences in uh, sizes when you talk about uh, very tall pieces, large pieces and smaller pieces. But the, I guess the way that juxtaposition to me, sometimes I always talk about when it's about curating, do you put similar things together or just opposite things together? Meaning wise, uh, feeling wise, color, size, uh, all those elements and Somehow, I always liked opposites. I guess they complete mm -hmm. each other more than putting similar things together. Although, I guess we are always inclined to go with what's close to each other, side by side. But if we can bring the opposites uh, next to each other, I guess they complete each other in such a strong way and it becomes more harmonious for me. This is my opinion. Um, mm. In this space, we have really, it's a small, because the, uh, unlike the other venue, Canal Gallery is rather small space. So how you navigate all these different sizes, that's such a small space, is quite challenging. But I guess Sage did a wonderful job and they worked very well, very nicely together. And uh, in this, this wall is quite large and it's quite sparse, you would think. Like my pieces are 12 by 12, all three pieces, small. You would think that they might be lost, but together, because they are together, in this case, I'm so happy they were kept together. The meaning uh, of those pieces also, they shouldn't be separated, in my opinion, and I'm so glad they were together. If they happened when my daughter became pregnant last year, I, I met grandma, my grandbaby will be eight months old this Saturday. I just came from New York about an hour ago, actually, visiting him. That's when this series holding came together. It's all about me, my daughter, and her baby. Uh, I designed this little, uh, looks like a womb and a baby inside the womb. And from there, the whole series developed and talking about the alchemy, going towards traveling into myself, towards inside me. This was perfect in all, by all standards, it came out perfect. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, I was uh, a little nervous at first that there wasn't enough work for the space, but it is a more intimate space and it really kind of guided this, this feeling of conversation between the pieces, but also being able to give the work some breathing room. Um, just, it just felt really pleasing to me. Um, so I was really happy. Yes, absolutely. That's why it works so well. There's so much breathing room. That's why I guess it works so well. Yeah, um, I'm going to do one last question and then we could open it up. I see some questions answered in the chat. Thanks for everybody for jumping in. Um, but uh, Anne-Marie, we were in the space together on Wednesday and you mentioned that you loved having your piece between these photographs. I would love to just to hear sort of what emotional <laughs> space that. Uh, yes, I think it's, you know, uh, it's a very, and you know, uh, a very nice position for the piece. Uh, it's a very personal piece. Uh, I mean, it's traveling inward, you know, toward my, uh, and it was also a pandemic, pandemic piece. Uh, and, and I guess the travel inward was actually childhood trauma, but uh, so there is shift, there is tension, there are nice color, but, 
this sense of, uh, and but it's also disruptive. And I think it's just, you know, the um, aesthetically just, um, you know, match so well with uh, Sage, uh, next picture of the yellow chair and, and the, the, the gradient uh, in um, Lee's uh, tapestry. Uh, so the play on shape and colors and, so it and it, yeah, so I I think it's a very very uh, good um, um, placement and very good conversation with the other pieces. Excellent. Um, I'm just going to scroll through these just so we can get um, an idea of everybody's works in the show. Again, this beautiful grid by Alyssa. Um, standing piece by Claire. And I'm not sure if I showed Patrick's here too. Um, yes. This beautiful skeleton molds. Um, I also just wanted to talk really briefly about, it's already 701, I don't wanna keep anybody too, too late, um, but just all of the aspects that go into putting a show together and this postcard being one of them and how do you uh, bring all these elements into one space together. So thank you Nilu for doing this design um, and including everybody on the postcard because I think they just really, really have come together beautifully. And they're available if you wanna take a little piece away when you visit the galleries, uh, we welcome you to do that. Um, so this went by way quick, um, but I'd love to um, have anybody ask questions if, they um, want to connect with these artists while we're all in this space together. Yeah. Or any other comments that you just really want to get in this space? This is recorded also, so I'm glad this um, this document will be. Oh, a question. Maybe Aaron could answer this in the chat. Um, and we're sorry we didn't have you, Susan, for this this course. I'm sorry, I'm not. Did I miss something? I've been scanning through the chat. Oh, it's direct message to me. I'm so sorry. Oh, um, okay. It's about um, reapplying for the workshop next year. I'll send it to you. Okay. Cambridge. Well, doesn't seem like there's any questions. I would love to just thank all, all the artists for being along this journey and coming together with these two beautiful exhibitions and really, you know, sharing your process and your your heart in this. I just wanted to thank you, Francis and Cambridge Art Association for um, taking us on this journey and sort of... Um, holding our hand and guiding us through and, and, um, and all and, to, and also to thank all the other artists for sharing so much of themselves and their work to put this together. It was really an exciting process. Yes. I second that. I just wanted to thank for the whole journey, for the experience, for Cambridge art, uh, organizing, offering this workshop and for Francis for guiding us in such a smart, intelligent, beautiful, friendly way. Thank you so much. And thank you to Francis and all of the artists. So as we mentioned, this was recorded. It will be shared either tomorrow or Monday, depending on how much time we have to get things posted. Um, but do stop by the gallery. It's uh, Sea at Canals open Wednesday through Friday, noon to four, and University Place is open Monday through Friday about 10 to 6 um, and on Saturdays from 10 until 1. If there Absolutely. aren't any other questions, we'll wish everyone a great night. Happy February. <laughs> and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Oh, I got to start recording.